Well, warm welcome for Florian Hanno from, um, from LG Electronics. Um, I keep the pace, so I'll let you know if you run out of time. Um, oh, yeah. Otherwise, oh. I just give you the stage. I think um, I'll thank you. start a stopwatch. Okay, so I'm Florian, I'm from LG Electronics, um, senior software engineer, and uh, this is a talk about uh, the WebOS Kuti Valent compositor. Now, you might ask yourself, why do I care about the WebOS compositor? So, um, this should inspire you that you can also ship Valent uh, in your device, and um, so it's also a little, yeah, tales from the trenches maybe, or lessons learned, so, yeah, to inspire you to also ship Valent. Uh, I'll introduce myself. I studied computer science at, in Erlangen. Um, I have 13-ish years of Linux and C++ experience. Um, eight years I uh, worked with Qt um, on the desktop. I worked on Mego browser and WebOS. And for five years I worked uh, on WebOS. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and on WebOS, I worked on the compositor, um, hence this talk, uh, also the system UI, and uh, why that is, you will learn, and uh, most recently on some of the WebOS apps. So, uh, HP WebOS, you might remember, um, it's a Linux-based operating system. Uh, it's web-centric, so uh, we have HTML apps and native apps. Uh, HTML apps as first-class citizens, and cloud integration was a, was a big factor of uh, HP WebOS. Uh, it had a innovative multitasking <laughs> card UI, so I recently learned that the uh, iPhone X looks very much like what uh, WebOS looked like back then. Um, we used, or HP used, a custom toolkit at first and later migrated to Qt 4.7, which is around the time that I joined the project. And uh, recently, or not that recently actually, it was released uh, open source as open WebOS. And it was shipped, um, for example, on the Palm Pre, which is a smartphone with a uh, keyboard and the HP touchpad, which is a, yeah, tablet. So uh, LG acquired the WebOS IP, and um, uh, we. So that was uh, also the time that I joined, and uh, we migrated to a new hardware platform, and uh, we had new use cases, and different input devices. So you can see the Magic Remote in the corner, which is a pointing device combined with a uh, four-way uh, arrow key navigation kind of ring and the scrolling wheel, all of which uh, the uh, HP devices didn't have. They were all touch. And obviously, uh, we wanted a new UX to fit all of these uh, new use cases on the TV. So because touch doesn't make a lot of sense, and the TV is not a touch pad, um, we had, or designers invented a new UI to go with it. So. Um, when we migrated uh, the HP WebOS to our LG platform, we were left with uh, components um, and had to find a way to uh, connect them. So there's a, a compositor or window manager that we had. Uh, we uh, started using Qt framework to replace some of the um, proprietary HP components that we couldn't uh, take over um, or port. Uh, you, you have the system UI. You have a new hardware platform. Um, you have things like apps, uh, native apps, uh, web apps, and the on-screen keyboard. And all of that uh, we connected using Wayland. Now, Wayland was quite young at the time, but we found that uh, it worked uh, well and uh, was stable enough for us to work with it. So we picked Wayland to connect all of these components. So the decision factors that uh, went into our design is that the compositor is just another UI, and uh, as the UX um, evolved, 
uh, with new designs and changes here and there and different use cases uh, being introduced, we wanted to stay flexible. So uh, we used uh, well-known tools to us, to our team, which was QML and JavaScript, and um, that allowed us to handle application surfaces just like any other UI element in the scene graph. So um, we didn't have to learn much about that part. And um, at the time already Qt Declarative and Qt Valent already had good integration with each other. And so the decision was made. Uh, we would make a Qt Valent compositor based on Qt Declarative and Qt Valent, obviously. So our compositor uh, is one process that incorporates um, both or these four components being uh, compositing surfaces with the live video plane. So live video is still uh, on a hardware accelerated plane in the background, but surfaces are uh, composited on top of that. Um, this has reasons for image quality and, um, well, memory bandwidth being two of them. Uh, if you have the video on a hardware plane, you can do um, much better uh, image uh, improvements on a specialized silicon. Um, so window management is also the, another thing that we incorporated into our compositor process. Um, so which window is in the foreground and at, at which position, and there's a C ordering if you have overlaid windows on top of each other. Um, the launcher bar we also integrated um, because uh, designs showed um, surfaces of applications that are currently running or uh, have been previously been used uh, kind of uh, weaved in and out of, the, uh, of the, the ribbon that we have in the TV. So we decided the launcher should go into the same process. And uh, it just came naturally that task switching also um, goes into the same process. Uh, and then we have a couple of Wayland extensions uh, to fit uh, special uh, platform use cases now. XDG desktop was not the right fit for us, and um, so we decided to kind of uh, implement our own shell. So this is a classic uh, display server anatomy, as you might remember or recognize it from X11. So you have a compositor in, in the center, the centerpiece, which might be your X11 server, or uh, in different um, configurations might be Weston. Uh, you have a display protocol, which is X11 or Valent. And uh, you have processes that uh, bind or talk that display protocol, like the window manager, um, or well, the applications in the first place, but then also the window manager and the system UI and home screen all talk the display protocol and connect to the compositor. The compositor just um, basically blending services together. And then you have a system bus, bus with different services that um, connect all of that. Um, now the WebOS compositor, instead uh, we have everything that is window management and launcher and uh, home screen is all in the compositor process. So it's all um, just QML. And uh, QML uh, uses Wayland through Qt Wayland Qt declarative bindings. So uh, all of the Wayland object, objects just uh, show up as um, Qt declarative items. And on uh, the applications, we have QML or native applications, they use the Qt Valent QPA. And uh, web apps run on Chromium, on a Chromium runtime, which also uses the Qt Valent QPA. What's happening? Uh, yeah. And, um, well, on the bottom end, uh, the, uh, our compositor process obviously has to talk to the screen or the hardware somehow, so we have our TV platform QPA, which is, a, well, it's a kind of EGLFS kind of deal. Uh, the system service that we use on WebOS is Luna Service 2, which has been used on WebOS since before my time, actually. So if you want to uh, implement uh, a or ship a valent device, uh, you will have to have a GPU driver that supports a Valent. And these are the pain points or the, the crucial points where you have to implement it. 
So um, from the let's start from the application uh, side. Um, the EGL driver or EGL user space library it needs to be able to map a EGL surface that your application draws to to a valent surface. The valent surface then you can send over the valent um, protocol. Uh, it's just a file descriptor at, at that point. And uh, when the uh, compositor receives it, it will need to unwrap that valent surface file descriptor and get a EGL image back. The EGL image then um, you can uh, bind to a chill texture and at that point you can just render it using OpenGL again. So um, when we started, uh, Valent was young as I mentioned. So um, yeah, we didn't have uh, Valent support in our driver and very few um, embedded GPU drivers did have Valent support. Uh, we did prototype at that point and uh, LibHybris, um, well, if I remember correctly, I think I actually implemented that part. So LibHybris allows you to uh, take the closed source GPU libraries, the user space part, uh, it wraps it, and then you can call it on a um, glibc based system. Like usually you don't have an Android, Android has a different uh, uh, C runtime, as you might know, and you might not want to use it, you might want to use the uh, glibc. So LibHybris wraps and loads these um, built for Android GPU drivers, and then you can use them in your GNU Linux distribution. Now uh, let's look what it looks like um, from a code point of view in, inside the compositor. So I mentioned that uh, the valent objects just look like um, just look like um, uh, Qquick items, right? So what does that actually look like? So here's a little example code snippet. What we did is um, the compositor exposes a surface model which, is, which implements uh, the abstract item model, so it can be used in any few uh, that you might want to use. And um, what we also have is a, what we call a window model, and it, has, uh, it allows you to uh, specify a filter function, a sort function. So, for example, uh, you might want to filter surfaces that are full screen, like in this uh, full screen filter function. And you might want to filter them by the last time it was full screen, so you can sort them in a kind of task switcher way. So this window model is also a abstract item model. And then at the bottom, we can just use that in a list view and um, bind a delegate to it. And in the delegate, we can just use the surface item, uh, resize it to uh, delegate itself and reparent it, and then we can just display it in a list. Now, uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, caveats uh, you must be careful about if you implement a, a QML compositor. So, the scene graph renders your composition. What that means is that if you have a complex scene graph, uh, your, the application's FPS or the rate that it can render at, which should be, it should match your display FPS of 60 hertz uh, most of the time. So uh, if you have a complex scene graph, the compositor will bottleneck that and you will, uh, you will end up having less FPS. And that's uh, not uh, nice to have. Uh, your users will want to have fluid 60 FPS scrolling. So uh, what we do is uh, we minimize the scene graph when we put in uh, full screen so there's nothing else on the screen just the bare minimum, for example, uh, the app is full screen, nothing else on the screen. It should be just that surface being blitted using OpenGL, and then uh, the user presses home and brings up the home screen, then that gets, becomes visible again, and then, uh, well, uh, the user is more focused on, he wants to use the home screen or launcher, whatever. Um, also, if you uh, use QML to switch between surfaces, uh, you should be careful with bindings that are too costly and that uh, cause stalls, um, because that will be visible as glitches or you know stutter. So let's look at a couple of uh, results that we achieved with uh, this architecture. Um, so obviously, I mentioned the TV. Um, yeah. The, it doesn't animate, but it used to animate in the other file format. So, um, 
We have the launcher ribbon, which I mentioned is part of the composer process at the bottom. We have a recently used app, which is, um, ended up being, being just a snapshot, but it could in theory be live, actually displaying the application live. Uh, we have information about the foreground application, and then we have uh, some buttons for quick settings. And in the background, we have the currently live application. Now, if that application ends up being a live input, like uh, from tuner or HDMI or the other inputs, it will just be the, uh, the composer will just be transparent at that point, and we will see that uh, optimized hardware video playing directly. But in later uh, WebOS uh, versions, we do support mapping uh, TV input to textures so that we can actually move them around, rotate them arbitrarily. We also ported it to a uh, smartwatch. Um, so that was around 2015 early. Um, so it scaled down to 240 by 240 pixels um, and a much weaker um, SOC, obviously, uh, it has a tiny battery, um, or has to have a tiny battery, so you want to use a uh, smaller SOC and less RAM and so on. So um, we had to work on um, removing, uh, reducing memory footprint, uh, CPU scaling, and still uh, it should be fluid. And yeah, the, the watch has LTE connectivity, so it works without a phone. Um, so power saving, memory saving, I mentioned input latency was a big issue um, because uh, now when we ported to the watch, it was a long time since we last looked at the touch device. So this was the first time with the new QT5 stack that we looked at touch again and our previous uh, use cases didn't include touch. So, um, and if you use touch to scroll, it becomes really noticeable if there's input latency and uh, you have to remember that the touch hits the scene graph of the compositor, then has to bubble into the item, the quick item that represents the application. The application has to process it. The application has to re-render itself to represent. It actually has moved the list, and then that gets flipped, the surface get, uh, gets flipped, and then bubbles up back to the compositor. At that point, the compositor will update the screen. So this uh, chain of events um, needs to be optimized so that you, when you scroll, there's as little latency as possible. We also worked on a reuse, a reuse, reusability of components and modularization. modularization. Um, so we had use cases of switching not only the, um, the, the watch uh, clock face, which is an application on that platform, but also the launcher, which, which still was in the uh, composer process. So uh, we worked on unloading the QML, well, kind of tree from, from the launcher and downwards, and then loading a different implementation back. Um, but we also worked uh, to make the launcher itself a separate process, because in this design, it wasn't as integrated as on the TV. Uh, we also ported it to a fridge, which was more straightforward, um, but still a new UX design. Uh, we have a translucent touchscreen in a portrait configuration, and um, so this was, a, I think, a, if I remember correctly, were two, two-person effort, and a couple of weeks uh, we were able to port our existing and reuse uh, our existing modules to a fridge, and um, yeah, so the fridge also shipped. Um, yeah, I was part of that team. And um, we also are working on signage solutions. So um, you might have seen in airports, uh, there's many displays displaying current information or in um, you know, fast food restaurants and many places you have screens that show information like uh, timetables or the menu or something. And um, also hotels uh, use our signage solution in different configurations. And the use cases uh, we worked on here are linking multiple screens. For example, you can see that there's two TV screens uh, side by side, and they show one scene graph. And we have different solutions for that that we worked on. Um, for example, uh, GL call streaming and uh, also just HDMI um, well, splitting. And not sure that exactly works, but. So we have one solution using GL and one solution using just a raw um, HDMI signal. And also touch screens on these bigger devices. 
So some thoughts on um, QML and for our use cases. So uh, QML allowed us to iterate in our designs quite quickly. And um, if you're careful with your components, you can make them reusable. And uh, if you probably will have to have the odd uh, native component just for performance reasons, uh, but also to integrate with some service that you have on your uh, system. Like in our Luna service, uh, we have it, it's a na so it's a native bus, so it has to have a native uh, connection. So we have uh, native items that we can then uh, use in QML. <laughs> the compositor is in the startup hot path, so it's the first thing that a user sees. You power on your TV, you want to interact with it, you want to use it, so the compositor has to come up quick. So uh, you should watch out for time that the compositor or a, that a complex QML application will just take uh, if you're not careful. So uh, QML files uh, have to be parsed, and then there's JavaScript in them that has to be compiled or loaded. And then there's, uh, you might have um, shader effects or you know, just the um, regular QML items use uh, H, uh, OpenGL to draw, so they use GLSO, and that has to be compiled. Now there are solutions for most of these, for example, um, Qt has now um, pre-compiled QML, and you think you can also, that also includes JavaScript. And then you can also use um, pre-compiled GLSL um, that gets stored with a hash, so you, uh, same file maps to the same uh, compilation result. Yeah, these are things you can do. And um, you should uh, avoid complex and deep scene graphs for the performance reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, it, you can also just lazy load things later uh, just to bring up some message or something on the screen that a user can see, okay, my TV is um, it's doing something or I can already do something, but uh, once I press this menu button or that, uh, it will uh, lazy load some other QML in. Two minutes, okay. So uh, big images can store OpenGL um, in the text image to decal, and that is, uh, we found driver memory allocations uh, PVR, ETC are formats that use drastically less memory, so use them if, you're, if, if um, the look of the image is not that important. I mean, it's like PNG versus JPEG. You need to know what is important at that point. Uh, the performance analyzer can point you to complex bindings and JS calls, and just use classic logging and tracing in places that you suspect. Yeah, so the outlook is uh, a application that we developed on top of our signage platform, which is a whiteboard that you can draw on. Uh, it has multi-touch. Um, we plan to support pens and palm arrays, and um, so you can erase with your whole hand. Uh, you can annotate over, over PDF files, and you can share files between participants. You can plug in your uh, laptop and annotate on the HDMI, out HDMI output from your laptop. Um, I would have loved to demo this, but while setting it up this morning, I let out the magic smog from the LVDS HDMI converter board. So unfortunately, I can't demo it. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, what, what a pity yeah. you don't have that with us. Well, I can show you the hardware, but it's, I mean, it's dead. <laughs> Are we not interested in hardware at all? <laughs> uh, are there any questions towards uh, Florian on, on, I would say, pretty ambitious setup you have? Um, Happy cute use. <laughs> so any questions on your end? If not, then we just continue with the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>